This week we're in Prague in the Czech Republic and this is the oldest working astronomical clock in the world. It dates back to 1410. It's beautiful on its own, but there's a hidden surprise when the clock strikes on the hour. Animated figures are revealed from within, at the top for us to see once those doors open. Just like DNS, and I'm really stretching here, can secretly exfiltrate information from your organization. What am I talking about? Let's find out. Secure Ninja. Hey everyone, it's Andrew from Secure Ninja again. I'm here with Chris from Infoblox. Hey Chris, how's it going? Just grand. Listen Chris, we've all heard the term DNS security, but now we're using terms like protective DNS solutions. Tell us what are they and why do we need them? Sure, uh, protective DNS solutions are actually characterized around uh, solutions that are inject themselves into the DNS traffic pattern in a way to validate the destinations of DNS queries. So what is DNS? DNS is the phone book for the internet and the internet. It helps you find things like your printer on your local network. It also helps you get to Google, Facebook, and other news locations. Uh, but what happens is, is that malware, uh, according to the National Security Agency, as of a study two years ago, that 92% of malware utilizes DNS for command and control communications. And we've seen that in things like the SolarWinds related breach, uh, with most notable breaches, uh, DDoS attacks, things like that, DNS is utilized. And so what we do is, is protective DNS solutions actually inject threat intelligence into that communications process. So it validates, does this computer need to actually connect with this destination on the internet? So think zero trust in a way. Do I trust the internet at large? No, you shouldn't. So we inject threat intelligence into that and we say, should this computer connect to this destination? Now, one of the limitations with that is, much like file hashes with antivirus, you have to actually know about the threat in order and the destination in order to actually block on that. So what we end up doing from an Infoblox perspective is we look at behavioral aspects mm -hmm. and the signature aspects of the DNS communications themselves. And we look for DNS tunneling, we look for DNS exfiltration, we look for DNS infiltration, uh, downloading or bringing external resources into the environment over DNS. And this is hugely prevalent and has been around for years. And that's what we're, we're facing off against. Excellent. So we're not just using block lists, for instance, or reputation-based IP addresses. Mm -hmm. We're doing a kind of layer 7 inspection. Correct. And, that's, and, and again, that's part of the challenge with block lists. They're very limited. You have to know about something being bad in order to block on it. And that's why the solar winds, in particular, the solar winds as one of the most recent breaches was so impactful to the defense industrial base and to the federal government was the fact that the particular domain had been around since July of 2018 and it sat there idle until such time as the threat actor turned it up and started utilizing it. Nobody recognized that domain as being bad. And so once there was communication starting to occur with those domains, there was nothing to flag and say, hey, you need to block this until it was too late. Excellent. Well, I think we have Nick here also, Nick. Um, you're going to do a demonstration of some of the simple uh, DNS exfiltration and infiltration attacks. Correct. Yep. Excellent. So let's have a look. What do you got going for us? So we're going to start with the uh, data exfiltration via DNS tunneling. Okay. Um, so exfiltration in this scenario, um, my laptop acts as an internal client on your network or on your enterprise, and my DEX portal here is going to act as the attacker's uh, DNS okay. server. So the first thing I want to show is uh, plain text data okay. exfiltration. So what you can do, if this is my domain, if I'm an attacker, yep. I, I create a domain, baddomain.com, and what I can do is I can send a plain text query using, uh, in this example, I've used what looks like a social security number. Excellent, yeah. So as you can see, if I go ahead and I send this query, I get an NX domain, I get no response. However, that query has still left the network. It's left the enterprise, it's gone out to my DNS server, which is hosting baddomain.com. So if I have any type of DNS logging or anything set up, I can clearly see this social, this PII in 
my logs. So any kind of logging on the web server or any kind of service running like a capture service Correct. running yep. on the web server will yep. capture that information. And it looks completely innocent. Exactly. It just looks exactly. like somebody has mistyped the subdomain. Yep, exactly. Well, that's very simple. It's in plain text and, you know, that, that's pretty good. Anything else to show us? Yeah, absolutely. So there's also other ways to do it. Um, a lot of times attackers to get around current DNS security will encode these messages. Yeah. So if we look here, if I... Um, paste in some PII here, uh, you can see that there's ways to create encoded DNS queries. Um, so what I can do with these DNS queries is I can copy them. Excellent. And I can go into my terminal here and I can send these queries. And as you can tell, it breaks up the data because I have uh, several lines of text in here. So it breaks up the data into several lines of queries. Yeah. And then after five seconds here, um, you know, this acting as my DNS server or my caching server, I've got all this PII information here just through DNS. Excellent. So you had literally the same thing. You were creating multiple subdomains, but you encoded them using hex encoding. And any kind of DLP system that wasn't smart wouldn't notice that's what was leaving the network. Exactly. It would go completely undetected. Excellent. And it's recreated completely, um, yep. absolutely, on the receiving side. Again, you would need control of either the name server um, or the web server Correct. that this data is going to. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. So very easy to exfiltrate over port 53. Oh, very easy. Very yeah. easy. Yeah. And unless you've got a smart system watching, you're not going to see it leave. Well, exactly. You know, a standard firewall or even some of the newer next-gen firewalls won't, won't catch this, won't at least not it. until after it's, you know, the damage has been done. Excellent. Well, that's exfiltration covered pretty well. Um, would you have any demonstration for taking data in? for instance, infiltration of data, yeah, absolutely. downloading data absolutely. using DNS. So just like exfiltration, you can use DNS tunneling to do infiltration as well. Um, so that would involve, um, instead of me as the client pushing data to a DNS server to retrieve it you know, at my name server for my bad domain, this is actually downloading something from that DNS server onto the client within your network. Almost, looking like, uh, almost acting like a bind shell. We're exactly. going to go and call for information and download it. Exactly. Why would you do something like that? Well, if I'm an attacker, maybe I set up a server where I stage some malware. Mm -hmm. And now what I want to do is I want to infect this client with malware by downloading it right from yeah. the uh, server using DNS. Okay, excellent. So you could have a stager and a dropper. Correct. Yep. Excellent. So for this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a Windows executable file. We Ex could pretend like in a real life situation, you know, this would be the malware. Yeah. So what it does is it goes ahead and it creates a script that's going to go ahead and download that Windows executable file from the DNS server. Wow. So if I run this in my terminal just like before. So I went ahead and ran the script and yep. you can see Felix DNS EXE was infiltrated, zero bad chunks, so it's been downloaded. So if I come over here... So that script basically did multiple DNS queries to get the data and then recombined it into the executable file. Correct, correct. And now if I look here on my desktop, I've got the executable file downloaded on my machine. Excellent. And then all these hackers would have to do is run that and Bob's your uncle. Yep, exactly. You've got the machine owned. Yep. Excellent. Well, Nick, that was very interesting. Thanks very much for taking the time to show us all this. Yeah, hey, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the content. Now please remember to subscribe and to like because we have more content coming from the Czech Republic. I'm Andrew Howard with Secure Ninja TV. We'll talk to you again soon.